Hello, and welcome to week two of Animal Music. Some introductory questions. What is sound? What sorts of actions produce sounds? Why and how did animals become sensitive to sounds? What information does sound afford? When did communication sounds enter the picture? What common mechanisms do animals use to make communication sounds? And which communication sounds should we count as music? So, a first question, what is sound? Sound could be defined as what you hear, but that's a little bit circular, since to hear is pretty much, by definition, to perceive sound. So, in terms of physics, you could say that sound is objectively comparable to patterns of pressure fluctuation in the air. It's in the air for us when fish hear in water, they're hearing the same thing, pressure fluctuation. Solids also have pressure fluctuation. And just as an example, somewhat of a strange example, this is a picture of a spiral galaxy. Our galaxy looks like this too, the Milky Way. Many galaxies have this sort of spiral configuration. And you might ask how those spirals get there. It turns out that the stars that are in a given arm of the spiral right now are not necessarily going to be in that same arm at some other point in time. What looked like spiral arms to us are actually waves of compact and decompressing, stars moving together and going apart. So this is something that does happen in the air. Air moves together, goes apart again. It happens in water, it can happen in solids, but it's also happening at the scale of a galaxy. So it's the kind of thing that happens all over the physical universe. So this is one way that we could define sound. And you're going to watch a video on this that will help make it a little bit more clear. So you could define sound objectively, but you could also ask if a tree falls in a forest, will there still be a detectable pattern of pressure fluctuation? The answer to that is yes. So you also want to define sound as having a subjective component, the perception of pressure fluctuation. So if a tree falls in a forest, there's still going to be pressure fluctuation, but if there's no one around to hear it, then that's a tricky question to say whether that counts as sound or not, basically because we have different definitions of sound. So let's look at this subjective one. When a tree falls, it produces pressure fluctuations. It's the motion of the tree falling that produces changes in pressure. So it's the case that any type of motion produces some type of pressure waves, and you could hear them. Reciprocally, you could say that pressure waves can't be produced without some form of movement. So you might be thinking about your little speakers in your iPad right now, your computer, iPhone. They do have little tiny motion devices that produce the motion that produce the sound waves. Same with the big speakers that you get in your house. The bigger they are, the bigger the membrane is that can produce those pressure variations. So it really is movement that produces sound. This video I'm going to have you watch. It's just a video on the propagation of sound, and I think it clarifies some things. You can see a little speaker here, and they are air molecules and the speaker is pushing some of the air molecules closer together some of them are farther apart that ends up translating into pressure waves that we hear so in this sense to hear sound is really to detect movement so now let's ask what kind of information do we get from sound if to hear sound is to detect movement then it follows that to interpret sound involves some form of analysis of the kind of movement that created it. Interpreting sensory data is really mostly unconscious in animals, and it's also 99.999% unconscious in humans. I want to point that out because when I use the word interpret, you might think like, oh, how you consciously think about the sound. But consciousness isn't required, words are not required, having some sort of a declarative statement about the sound is not required. That's not what we're talking about here. And the nervous system, the way it's wired, is to extract information without requiring conscious attention. So most of our sensory processing does go on just because of the way the system is wired. We can think about some questions that our auditory system asks and answers, meaning how it has developed over evolutionary time to interpret sound. It asks the question, where did that sound come from? And one of the main ways it does this is by comparing the sound between the two ears. If it's louder at one ear than the other, if it arrives at one ear 
more quickly than at the other. And if the frequency spectrum is a little bit different at one ear versus the other, because the head changes the frequency spectrum. So if you have a sound coming from your right ear, when the left ear gets it, it'll come later. It'll be a little quieter and it'll specifically be quieter in the range of frequencies that the head tends to block. Your auditory system asks also what size of a thing created the sound. Bigger objects tend to create lower sounds. Bigger objects also just create more energy. So you listen for the frequency range, but also the intensity at all those frequencies. Your auditory system asks what kind of action created the sound. And that's one of the things that we'll be talking about. And you kind of listen for this if it's a sustained sound, let's say, huh, versus a very sudden explosion, implosion kind of thing something that's transient, your brain is definitely putting together what kind of an action it was that gave rise to the sound that it heard. And then finally, your auditory system is asking what degree of intensity caused the sound. And that could just have something to do with loudness. The closer something is to you, the louder it is. If a little tiny mosquito buzzes near enough to your ear, you can hear it. That doesn't mean it's a very intense sound, but for a given thing at the same distance, how intense the activity is it will be reflected in its loudness. So let's look more in depth at what kinds of motions or actions produce sounds. Since we're saying that what hearing is, is making sense of motion, then we can look at what kind of motion produces the sounds that we hear. There's going to be four main categories. Turbulence, explosions and implosions, transient motion, and excitation of resonance. And it turns out all these things are applicable both for human speech and also for music. You, you're tr probably trying to think about which pieces you know that have explosions right now, but let's just let's see where this takes us. So turbulence in a medium. The definition of this turbulence that produces sound is a difference in velocity between the medium and an object in the medium. So I gave a little example here of a little babbling brook. The water is one of the media and it's going in this direction and then the rocks are staying stable. So that's producing a difference in velocity and that it's going to be a sound as the water brushes up against the rocks. Other examples, air passing around an orifice or around an obstacle. So the same idea if the wind was blowing over the rock or it could be object moving through the air. And I was thinking about those little noodles that you use in the swimming pool and you swing those around real fast in the air, they produce a little humming sound. That's the object moving through the air, as opposed to the air moving through the object. A flute is an obvious example of air moving through an object, producing turbulence. In the human voice, we use this, for instance, whispering. I will whisper for a little bit. My larynx is not engaged. The vocal cords are not touching one another. They're just passing up noise, but then my mouth and the rest of my throat is shaping sound. So you're getting a broadband noise, not just an individual frequency with resonances, but then I'm still shaping that noise. And you can basically still understand the words that I'm speaking without having the fundamental pitch in there produced by my voice box. Whistling, I think this still counts as turbulence. So with some of these things, I'm not 100% sure where it would necessarily fall down in the category. But whistling would be just like whispering, except it's a much more narrow band of noise. I'm using my mouth and throat to narrow in on just a very specific pitch and then creating some resonance. So if this was is kind of like whispering, then I can gradually narrow in on the frequency and limit it to a very narrow band. And then it starts to have a positive feedback process with itself. So I think we would still call that turbulence. The sibilants, s, sh, and fricatives, f, th, are consonants that we use that involve turbulence. It's all air brushing over the lips or the tongue or the teeth and producing sounds in that way, in the same way as the babbling brook. And then with musical instruments, flutes and organ pipes seem that they're doing this kind of thing. The air is blowing over the edge of the pipe in some way, and that's creating turbulence that's then being resonated within the, the tube. And then flutter tongue is another example of this. I don't have a flute on me or any wind instrument, but you can do it with your voice too. So if I'm just singing, uh, but then if I go while I'm doing that and go 
and you can do it in the back of your throat too. I'm essentially producing one oscillation pitch, which is the pitch of my voice. But then I'm producing a second a rhythmic disturbance, like a rhythmic turbulence into the medium. And then that gives me a second frequency. So that ends up being pretty interesting. And we'll see something like that in various different animal vocalizations. So now we have explosions and implosions. We have kiss over there, and you'll maybe know why in a second. So an explosion and implosion, it sounds pretty dangerous for music and speaking, but it, it does happen in a sense. So an explosion or implosion is a sudden rush of a medium, usually with a broad spectral content. So that medium, you know, before we we're talking about air or water, when we are talking about the human voice, we have the plosives. So explosions would be plosive consonants. These are just like very small explosions, but when you go you're building up energy behind the behind the part of your mouth that makes the the k sound and then it it builds up until the pressure is too great and it kind of pops through. So that's an explosion. Same with ch Sorry, it might be loud for you. And same with glottal stops. I just said some languages really use that. They even put it into the the written word, which English doesn't. And then grunting generally, if you're picking something up heavy and you go, Ugh! that is in a sense that same sort of process. And then an implosion, we don't use this as much, but clicks, you're creating suction. So you're creating a, a vacuum of air above the tongue. And then it, when it releases, it makes a sound. And a kiss is kind of the same thing. It's like at least a puckering type kiss. You're not exploding air out of your mouth. You're kind of like pulling it in. Hence the picture at the top right. And then with musical instruments, attacks on any kind of wind instrument will probably function like an explosion. Transient motions. Transient just means brief or momentary. Some examples of these are a liquid dropping on a liquid, liquid on a solid, and then solid on solid. So some examples, it, liquids, if liquids are passing along other liquids. You can just call it turbulence. But then impact, so like I have put a raindrop at the top there or dripping faucet. Liquid on solid would be rain on pavement. You could have solid rubbing against another solid, so that's friction. And that would be the same as if you rubbed your hands together. Fracture would be something breaking. So twig breaking, if you crushed a dry leaf, if you bit into an apple, you'd hear the sound of the, the breaking fracture. Percussion, hand clap, footstep, I put a tap dancer there. Percussion, we obviously have percussion instruments, so this is usually important for music. I was trying to think about musical examples that use fracture, and I can't think of all that many times that we break something, because we kind of have to keep using our sounds over and over. I guess maybe at the end of a Who concert. And then rapid deformation. An example of this is paper being crumpled, and then back in the day in radio shows when they wanted to make the sound of thunder, they would shake a metal sheet. So I think that counts as rapid, rapid deformation too. And then I just want to bring in here that when percussion is fast enough, if it's above 20 times a second, I actually counted this the other day when I go, that's at about 25 times a second. And it's still pretty low. You don't really hear it as a pitch, but if I do it without humming at the same time, if I could speed it up, it would start to sound like a pitch. So a percussion sound, if it's we're fast enough, can be perceived as having a pitch. And this is what's going to happen. We're going to call this the pulse repetition rate. So when we talk about fish vocalization in a couple, two classes from now, the fish has a swim bladder that is shaking, which produces a noise. So it's kind of like a percussion. But the noise is going 100 times a second. So it really produces a pitch at 100 hertz, which is like a low G at the bottom of the bass clef staff. And a bunch of animals use that in different ways. Okay, and then this last category of how to make sound is called excitation of resonance. And the definition that the authors that I was looking at give for this is an excitation of resonance is when you have energy from a non-fluctuating source, when it's converted into rapid fluctuations in a resonant system. So that non-fluctuating source, it could be something that's constant pressure as you would have if you're singing, so you fill up your chest with air and then your chest muscles are kind of pushing it out at a constant rate. Or it could be constant motion, as in you draw a bow across a violin string. 
just the one bow's length would be the constant pressure source. So what's going on is the non-fluctuating source, which is like, the, let's think of the air in the lungs when you're singing. The non-fluctuating source acts on a relaxation process. So in the voice, air pressure from the chest pushes up and out on the vocal folds. And we do have a picture at the top right, which we'll get a bit more into in a second. And so the vocal folds, they're being held together and the chest is pushing up air that wants to go through the vocal folds. And as long as the pressure is strong enough, it manages to break through. So the vocal folds yield to the air pressure every once in a while, letting out a little tiny bit of air and then they snap back. And they do this, it, it's that process. It happens very rapidly. And so if someone's singing, Mm, if I am singing 100 hertz tone, the air is breaking through 100 times a second. So it happens rapidly, but to think about it, you can just think about this is the larynx. The air wants to pass through up in here. These folds are held pretty close together. It can't get through. This blue arrow is the airflow. And then every once in a while, the pressure builds up enough that the vocal folds like, it lets them out and then it closes again. And it does that 100 times a second, then you produce 100 hertz tone. So you're going to watch some videos where you understand the vocal apparatus a little bit better, but this is like the front, this is the Adam's apple, basically, the thyroid cartilage, the front of the vocal apparatus. These are the vocal folds, air wants to go through here, and then these red things are muscles, these yellow things are cartilage. It's not bones there, but the hard stuff is, is cartilage. And then the tension that you create in the vocal folds determines the frequency of the vibration. The resonance system then feeds back and makes this relaxation process even more congruent with it. So in, in this picture, this is the air going through here is producing the vibration. And then up here in the throat and the mouth, you're changing the shape of the throat and mouth to create different resonances. And those then, they select out different aspects of what's going on in here. And then they encourage the, you to keep doing the sorts of things that you're doing that are resonating. So there's a feedback process between the generation of the vibration and then the resonance that it creates. So I thought of some examples of this, and most of these are like slower than what would happen in the voice. So one, one really slow and simple one would be singing in a tunnel or a cathedral. The orchestra musicians say this a lot, that if you're going to play in a different hall than you're used to, you, you definitely have to adjust the way that you play a piece, and you pretty much have to adjust the tempo. The tempo at which you play a piece is pretty determinant on how long the sounds last in the particular hall that you are in. So in a sense, at a very slow scale, you're producing a sound and then you're listening to how the space that the sound is sent out into responds to it. And then you adjust somewhat what you're doing based on that space. That's exactly what's happening in the vocal apparatus. In that case, you are the vocal folds <laughs> and you're listening to how the sound is reacting in the resonance cavities of the throat and the mouth and then adjusting based on what works best. So that's sort of like a slow psychological version of what happens in the physical system of the voice. I have some other examples. So tapping with a metronome versus tapping with another person. So say the metronome is at this rate and you just want to tap along with it. Maybe you can do this with me at home, <laughs> tapping along. But if you were tapping with another person in the same room instead of a metronome, in the first case, when you're tapping with the metronome, you have to do all the adjustments to adjust to the metronome. But if you're doing it with another person, you adjust to them, but they also adjust to you. So that is a case of feedback. It just means that the one system is you. The other system is either a metronome or another person. And the metronome doesn't respond to you. There's no feedback, whereas the other person it does respond to you. That's a similar concept to producing some vibration here. It produces resonance in the upper vocal tract. And then if that resonance feeds back to influence the vibration, then that's more like this second case when you're tapping with another person as opposed to just tapping with a metronome. Um, this is a more musical example. It's going to be rhythmic playing with a delay pedal. I'm going to have you watch a very short clip from a short video. And I'm not really sure whether this will completely make sense to you as doing a similar thing, but I guess it is. It's it's. You're producing a sound, 
you're then listening to how that sound is processed in the environment. In this case, it's through the use of a delay pedal. And then you're, you're like this guitarist is just making sure to line up what he's doing with the exact speed of the delay. And it produces an iconic sound and you've heard it all over music and you've probably heard this tune before. So let's just listen for a minute or two. <laughs> What's happening there is the delay is set to being a dotted eighth note basically so if this is the tempo the delay is set to three quarters of the length of that so the guitarist is playing along with that that's something that happens on the slow scale at the rhythmic scale but if you sped that up a bit that's what's happening when you get feedback between resonance cavity and whatever you're doing in your main vibrator that's producing the sound. And we also have two examples from a bowed violin string, which we'll see on the next page, and then some the wind instruments. So let's take a look at violin string. So as we talked about like this excitation of resonance idea, you have a constant motion. You're supplying constant motion and you're doing that in this case by just dragging a bow across the string. And then we now have to figure out what is creating the resonance and then what's going to feed back with that constant motion. So in terms of what this motion does, you have resin on the string, on the bow strings. And the resin fibers catch onto the violin string and then they're pulling it aside and they're doing that until the tension is just too great and the string slips away from the resin and slips back to its normal resting position. But then the bow is still moving, so then the next resin fiber catches it and pulls it again. So by just drawing the bow slowly across the string, you have a series of resin fibers that catch the string and let it go and catch the, and the next one catches it and lets it go, etc. But then the way that the string is tuned, how tight it is, where the finger is on it, what it's made of, that kind of thing, the fundamental frequency that it's tuned to, that is going to determine the rate at which it vibrates. So the, the rate at which the resin fibers catch it and then let it go again. The resin fibers pull the string over until it has to let it go, and then the next resin fiber catches it. The string, So the string actually overshoots the resting position. So it gets pulled to one side, then when it's let go, it swings to the other side. And then as it's coming back again, the next resin fiber takes it. So there ends up being a precise time in which the string will be most ready to be pulled by the next resin fiber, and that is controlled by the natural vibration frequency of the string. So the natural vibration frequency of the string, which is its resonance, similar to what we're talking about with the vocal tract. It's the frequency that the string wants to vibrate at because of how it's tuned. The natural vibration frequency of the string influences which frequencies that the bow feeds into it get promoted, you know, that actually produce sound, and then in, instead which ones get ignored. So there's lots of resin fibers all over the bow, but only the ones that are coming at the right time help the string to vibrate, and the other ones just don't do much at all. The bow just, or the string just slips past them. So the more that the bow excites this vibration frequency in the string, the more it, it the more locked in it is at each cycle, and it stays at that frequency. So that positive feedback process, it it's it builds upon itself, it snowballs. So so then once you have a string vibrating at the frequency that it wants to vibrate at, it's gonna keep vibrating at that frequency the more energy you you put into it. And that's gonna be the case not just with strings, but with, with all kinds of instruments. That's how we produce tones. So human voice. The constant air pressure is coming from the lungs. And this is a nice, simple little picture, but you have the lungs being the power. The power is pushing air up 
to the source, which is the larynx, the vocal cords, and then through the larynx and vocal cords up through the filter. And the filter is then shaping which, which of the resonances from the source get promoted and which ones get muted. The vocal cords, then if we looked down at the throat, and you're going to watch some videos where this makes more sense, but imagine you are looking down someone's mouth and you can see the vocal apparatus from above. When someone is phonating, which just means singing or talking, but if they're going, hmm, then here you can see the vocal folds are pushed together. This is like the front, this is the Adam's apple up here. This is the, the back of the throat. The vocal folds are pushed together and the air is coming through here and making these guys vibrate. Whereas if you're breathing, the glottis opens up and the air can just pass through easily without the vocal folds getting in the way. So to produce a sound, you have the constant air pressure from the lungs going up the trachea and out the mouth nose. The vocal cords are gently closed across the windpipe at the trachea. This forces air through them and allows it to burst through several times per second at constant rate, as long as the air pressure and the cord tightness are kept constant, of course. This produces the fundamental frequency of the vocalization which is equivalent to whatever the violin string is tuned to. And of course, if you tighten the violin string, it's going to make it higher pitch. The same as with your vocal cords. If you tighten the cords, you would increase the pitch. There are then two resonance cavities above the larynx. One that's vertical, right above the larynx. And that's like that lower little bottle, which says air. And then it, that's from the larynx to the back of the mouth. And then the other one is horizontal, and that goes from the back of the mouth to the front of the mouth. And that's the other bottle labeled air. So it, it seems a little silly, but I actually like that demonstration because it's very similar to what happens when you do have a bottle with you and you blow over the top of it and it goes, Ooh, <laughs> or <"Ooh." laughs> you are really exciting these cavities of air that want to vibrate at a certain frequency. And then you have two of them, and that's why you produce like two main formants. There are actually multiple resonances from the voice, but the two, the first two are the most important. So those are the ones that we're seeing here. The shapes of the cavities determine which upper resonances above the fundamental are excited and which are suppressed. And the lower cavity produces the first formant. The upper cavity produces the second formant. And the differences between vowels like ah, E, E, are predominantly the result of different formant differences, focal tract shape. So I promise you we will get into this stuff later, especially when we get to humans at the end of the course. There's certainly more to say about this, but I wanted to introduce this stuff now because most vertebrates have exactly this same system, and it's just best explained for humans. But for a little example, you're going to get to watch some beatboxing videos and other things over the course of the week. But this, if you took a cross section of someone's face and you saw the word heed, he, you could see the tongue is pushed up toward the top and that's narrowing the space in here, which is producing a very high pitched sort of sound. If you do the vowel hid, it's similar, except it's a little lower there. So you're still getting kind of a narrowing there, but it's, it's thicker there. If you go head, still a lot more space in there. So whatever frequency, high frequency this is producing here is going a little lower here and a lower lower here, and presumably more low here. And that's all from the tongue. And we can look at what's going on. So this is all, I think, the second formant. And the first formant is down here. And that looks all pretty much similar. Now for hod, you've got an, a closing right there. It's coming very close, so that's really narrowing the sound. And then that's gradually relaxing here. You're creating a pocket with hood, hood, hod. So, and then with hood, you're creating a little pocket of air that's going to go like that. And then you're also narrowing up here again. So it's the combination of the shape of the mouth and then sort of the back of the throat that's producing your different vowels. And that produces it by creating resonances. And I can say if the larynx is going to produce the same frequency the entire time. And I don't know if you can hear it, but oh 
with just a little bit of extra focus, you can bring out specific pitches in those resonances. That's what overtone singing is. Okay, and then with wind instruments, the relaxation process, this is what the larynx does. In brass instruments, it's the lips. You're going, <laughs> that's producing the vibration sound. In reeds, you're re vibrating the reed. In flutes, you're blowing over a hole, which lets the air go in and out of the hole at a certain rate. And then the resonance is created by the length and diameter of the tube. So with brass instrument, you're creating vibration, but then you're changing the length of the tube by pressing the different keys, and that's giving you the different notes. And that's gonna be the same with the reeds and the flutes too. What those keys do is they basically make the pipe longer or shorter. And then it, what's pretty important is that the resonance from the tube then feeds back and locks in with the relaxation process that's going on in your lips or in the reed or the airflow over the mouthpiece of the flute. So and there's one other thing that we are not discussing today, but brass players definitely know that with the, with the same given fingering, they can produce a bunch of different pitches based on the harmonic series. And it, that's similar for the reeds and the flutes, but with reeds and flutes, you often do use a little key, but it's sometimes called overblowing. So for any given length of tube, you can produce different sounds, which are the different partials. So let's now look at how animals detect sound. We went into what sounds are, how they're made, but what is it that an animal does to be attuned to the making of a sound, to be attuned to the pressure fluctuation? So one question to ask is, do all animals hear? My guess is probably all animals pick up pressure fluctuations to some degree. So let's say there's an earthquake. <laughs> probably all the animals would know it. But hearing is really a specialized sense that specializes in picking up what are actually very, very, very small variations in air or water pressure. The basic capacity of hearing could be done by other organs of your body. Like you can pick up vibrations from your feet, from the ground, if there's like a herd of buffalo approaching you. But hearing is something that bodies develop that is very, very, very delicately and precisely tuned to be able to pick up on those vibrations and those vibrations that are the most important for getting around in the world and surviving. The earliest auditory systems that animals had came from two other systems. One of them is the vestibular system. You probably know about the semicircular canals. There's fluid and hair cells in here. And when you turn your head, when you take your chin down to your chest or lift your chin up in the air, the water in this canal sloshes around. <laughs> and if you turn your head left and right, the, the water in this canal sloshes around. And if you tilt your head to the left or the right, then the fluid sloshes around in there. And if you're a fish, when the water vibrates, your body vibrates because fish bodies are the same density as the water. So if there's a large pressure fluctuation in the water, the animal would actually pick it up because its whole body would be moving. So if you're swimming after another fish, they know where your body is in space. They know if your head is tilted up or down or left, right. They pick up on your own movement, but that effectively allowed them to pick up on environmental sound as well. But it had to be really super loud. In mammals, you have these early on but the cochlea doesn't develop until a lot later. And this ends up being the main thing that we use. It's the same idea. There's hair cells in there and fluid and the hair cells pick up on movement of the fluid, but it ends up being just very, very highly sensitive for hearing. So then there's another system, which is the system of touch and there are cells in the outside of the body. So this is in animals that live in the water, fish and some amphibians, at least amphibians when they're in the tadpole stage. And I think some amphibians still have this, but the, but it doesn't work on land. But basically if you're in the water, you have hairs on the outside of your body. Then when the water around you is moving relative to you, then the hairs bend back and forth. Those hairs give you a sense of movement as well. We talked about this fish a little bit. We'll talk about it more in two weeks. It's called the midshipman. And you can see these little dots on the outside of the body. Those, I believe, are the lateral line system that has these hair cells that bend when the water is moving relative to the fish. So if you look a little bit more closely, those are like hairs and they bend as the water moves. Eventually what happened is that these hair cells, which are called mechanoreceptors, they receive mechanical movement. 
they gradually became more specialized for sounds. So fish that have those can hear loud, like really, if it's a really loud sound and pretty low, they can detect it. But they're kind of detecting it as touch, in a sense, or vibration of the body. But gradually, those hairs end up moving inwards. So in some fish, you see that they're found in ruts that get nestled into the skin. And then if you nestle them in even farther and put a little air sac around it that can amplify pressure vibrations, then this ends up becoming an ear. So that's what happens in later animals. Okay, so this is a reminder of what I had at the end of the last video, which told you about a little bit about how the structure of the course is. We're going to look at this with respect to hearing and vocalizations. So I'm making a little cladistic diagram, cladogram, clad... I don't know. You have evolution. You have all animals here. This is, this is earlier in time. And we're doing this human-centric. Like, we could have put humans at any point in this, and we just have to adjust some things around. So it's not like time progresses toward humans. It's just like we're specifically looking at human ancestry, and we're looking, we're asking other animals to tell us stuff about our own ancestry. So bilateria are just the bilateral animals, pretty much everything except sponges and uh, jellyfish. At this point in time, which is actually, I don't know how many millions of years ago, more than 500 million years ago, insects will diverge over here. Insects, these are just representative animals, but there, there's other animals, mollusks are in there too. All the invertebrates actually that are bilateral go this way, and then vertebrates end up going this way. And we're gonna look at insects in week three. Then with vertebrates, lampreys still exist and they they represent what we probably were like at this point in time which is like 450 million years ago and then everyone all the other vertebrates that are around developed jaws then there are vertebrates with jaws but they don't have bony skeletons they've got cartilaginous skeletons cartilage so sharks rays but then all the other ones that we're talking about were the bony vertebrates, bony fish, they're called. Then the teleos are one of the main branches of the bony fish. So we're going to see examples from them. But then all along this line continues all the other bony vertebrates that are not fish. So we're going to look at the things that are tetrapods. Tetrapods mean they have four legs. So this is amphibians, reptiles, mammals, birds, and humans, even though we have two legs and two arms, our arms are actually legs in this sense. So at this point in time, which is maybe 300 million years ago, I don't remember exactly, but amphibians, we can put them there. And then other amniotes. Amniotes have amniotic fluid, which includes mammals, obviously, but it also it includes reptiles and birds because they lay eggs. So at this point in time, with the amniotes, some of these tetrapods that didn't become today's amphibians developed a way to make eggs that they could lay on land and the amniotic fluid helped them with that. So then you get reptiles and birds that go off this way and then the, all the mammals go off this way and then within the mammals you get like just most general mammals and then other ones are primates and we're going to look at vocalizations in all these animals, mice, rats, bats, cetaceans are whales and dolphins, pinnipeds are seals and sea lions. So among your primates, you get monkeys that diverge there, and the rest are apes. And among the apes, you get the lesser apes, which are the gibbons, and then all the great apes. And then within the great apes, you get chimps, gorillas, orangutans, and then humans. Like I said, you could easily put humans there, and chimps, orangutans, and gorillas there. And then it would look like everything has progressed toward chimps, <laughs> or toward gorillas and orangutans. Right, you could do this any which way. This is a human-centric version of this. But this is how we're going to structure the class. It tells us a little bit about human evolution. I hope it's going to tell us about human vocalization, about singing and talking and music. So we finally get humans at the end. In week three, which is next week, we'll talk about insects. We'll skip lampreys and sharks, and you'll see why in a second. Then we'll talk about teleosts, and we'll specifically teleos or bony fish, ray-finned fish, and we'll talk about the midshipmen in particular. Then with amphibians, do that in week five. Maybe some stuff with reptiles, but definitely birds from week six, seven, and eight. Then mice, rats, bats, cetaceans, pinnipeds. So mammals other than primates. Then monkeys, gibbons, orangutans, chimps, gorillas. And then finally, the last two weeks, humans. But let's look at this diagram, cladogram, and ask which of these animals here and which of these animals vocalize. If you want to pause for a moment and see if you know the answer, see if you can figure it out. I mean, I don't know how you would, but okay. Well, welcome back. 
So lampreys and sharks probably can't hear. That's why we're not going to talk about them. Insects, we have to assume, can hear because they obviously make sounds. So they could be making sounds accidentally. Like my computer's can, you know, refrigerator makes sounds. But insects definitely seem to communicate with sound. And libraries and sharks probably don't vocalize. They probably can't hear. Insects are interesting because they evolve the ability to hear seven different times. So I've shown you just like one branch here. But really, along invertebrates, there's tons of stuff going on in seven different times the ability here was independently developed one example of this that's pretty interesting is moths so moths are a main prey animal for bats and bats use sound in order to echolocate and track their prey so moths ended up developing very keen hearing so they could hear predators even though moths don't communicate with one another in sound but they definitely hear quite well so if there's a certain pressure to be able to hear that can evolve on its own. Insects are also interesting and for another reason, which is that they tend to have ears at various places on their body, not just on their heads. I forgot to mention that among fish, we know that a lot of them can hear and a lot of them can vocalize. Maybe all of them can hear, but they seem to hear in quite different ways. And a lot of them vocalize, make sounds in different ways. And then by the time you get to amphibians, frogs at least are just like massively vocal and auditory. And then it seems like all these kinds of animals are auditory and vocal. So hearing seems to evolve somewhere in here. Maybe it evolved before all the teleosts. Maybe it evolved right around this time. Maybe it evolved here and here. You know, it's, it's, it's really hard to say. But both hearing and vocalizing seem to have evolved around here. You might ask which came first. And the answer is it wouldn't make any sense to, for vocalization to evolve before hearing because no one would hear it if you're going around singing. So presumably hearing evolves first so that you can be aware of predators. But then as soon as hearing evolves, you basically now can hear your peers as well. So your peers start communicating with you. But why do animals use sound to communicate? Humans and other primates are very visual. We have huge eyes, and the eyes face forward, unlike in some animals. And this gives us very good stereo vision, and we use it for social communication. If you look at the primate brain, the visual cortex is much, much, much bigger than it is in other mammals. So with primates, something visual definitely changed. Most other animals are strongly driven by the olfactory sense, the sense of smell. Olfactory cues linger for a long time. If you produce a sound, it lasts for a very short time. If you produce an olfactory cue, it lasts for a very long time. And those cues indicate where food can be found, which individuals have been present, and other sorts of things. Sounds, somewhat in contrast, are sudden and ephemeral. Ephemeral meaning they're short-lasting. That's a little bit like with vision, but anything that you see in your visual field is probably going to be around for a lot longer unless it moves really, really, really fast. So visual information itself is pretty ephemeral, but things that produce the visual information don't, don't disappear as quickly as the sounds do. So sounds are really very sudden and ephemeral, short-lasting. Sounds are detectable in 3D. So if, if you want to, to see something, you have to be looking in the proper direction. To hear something, you can be looking in any direction. Your, your ears will hear anything in 3D. Sounds also provide very good localization of where something happens. When you hear a sound that you weren't expecting and you turn your head toward it, that's an example of the ears guiding the eyes and head. And that is very a very basic function of the auditory system. And it can do this within one degree of space. So if you think of 360 degrees around you within one 360th of the space around you, that's how accurate your ears are at detecting where something came from in space. And sounds are more emphatic, meaning something visual can catch your attention. You can think, ooh, that's interesting. But there's no intensity knob. I mean, the more light something is, maybe it's, it's greater intensity. But with sound, the louder something is, the more likely it is to capture your attention. And that ends up being important. Sounds change complexly over time. They do that much more rapidly than visual cues do. So that allows for them to be a very good means of communicating. And they also pretty directly connect with the emotion system. So you have your auditory system brings in sound and processes them in, in a bunch of different ways. And basically at all the levels of processing 
it connects with the emotion system. And if you just hear a loud sudden sound, one of the fastest responses that we have is to go from hearing the sound to the emotion system that redirects the attention. So when you're talking to someone, you also have access to that emotion system. You can influence someone else's emotions just by making sound yourself. That's one of the main, it's got to be one of the main reasons that sound is used to communicate in so many animals. We're obviously going to be talking about each of these animal types individually in coming weeks, but let's just look briefly at how they make sounds. Insects evolved hearing independently seven different times, as I mentioned. And so they solve the problem of creating ears in different ways. Ears can be found in any part of the body, on the legs on the wings, on the abdomen. Ears, interestingly enough, are always in pairs, just like we have ears in pairs. And they always detect sounds, it turns out, between about 2 and 15 kilohertz. So 2,000 hertz and 15,000 hertz. Where I read that fact is in a book that was explaining that even though insects are tiny and humans are big and elephants are even bigger, all animals, irrespective of their size, seem to have auditory capacities in this range of 2 to 15 kilohertz. Now, 2,000... 2000 hertz is pretty high. It's toward the upper end of the piano, but we still hear those things. We don't think of them as being the most important musical pitches, but we definitely hear in that range. We hear up to 20 kilohertz, which is 20,000 hertz. So it's interesting that irrespective of what kind of animal it is, everyone tends to hear in this range. Many insects create sounds by stridulating, stridulating one part of the body over another over like a ridged edge of another as you do with a bow on a violin string and then sometimes they'll click their wings together as well as we'll see in a reading the following week let's just take a look at this very 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 zoomed in picture of a wing of a cricket and basically if you just ran one little thing like across that and you did it really fast you get <laughs> uh, it's video time. So we'll get more into that in future weeks. What mechanisms do fish use to make sounds? Fish can vocalize by shaking the swim bladder. So the swim bladder is basically what ended up becoming the lung in amphibians and reptiles and humans. You can see these things, they fill with air, they help the fish go up or down in water and there's muscles on them. And when the muscles shake, this, this big balloon type thing shakes and produces sound. They can also stridulate their pectoral fins. This is like the hip, you know, the pectoral girdle of the fish. And these look like the fins. And I think they run into each other or rub over one another. I'm not sure how it works, but they can produce sound that way. And <laughs> this is a head joint. This is like a bone, another bone. And apparently these things vibrate up against one another and produce sound. So <laughs> it's, but coming from the head. So a bunch of different ways fish can make sounds. Unlike in other vertebrates, fish do not use their respiratory apparatus to sing. They're not filling up their lungs with air, right? And then pushing the air over a larynx because they don't have lungs. They don't have a respiratory system that brings in air and then pushes it out. It's, it's different for fish. But what's interesting is that it's the same nuclei that control the voice in the brainstem of other vertebrates, like in, including us, right? The nuclei in our brainstem that control our voice. It's those same nuclei that control the vibration of the swim bladder in singing fish, or presumably also these muscles back here and here. So it's a question, what do we mean by vocalization? In the same way that this class is saying, hey, what do we mean by music? And if you define vocalization as making a sound with your vocal cords, then you wouldn't say that fish vocalize. But if you describe vocalization as making communicative communicative sound, you would describe this stuff as vocalization. And if you did say vocalization is something that is controlled with the vocal centers of the brainstem, which does kind of make sense, then you would definitely call this vocalization. So it's pretty reasonable to say that fish vocalize. With insects, I think it does become different, but we're still going to ask the question is like, how are they using sound communicatively and how does it influence other insects? Okay, so birds, again, just an introduction to what's going on with birds. Birds use their lungs. Birds do have lungs. The lungs in here would be down here and here, and this is these are like bronchial tubes. And then the trachea, 
and there are some syringeal muscles here. And I think the syringeal muscles are ultimately going to control in there. And this is going to be the thing that produces the tone. And there's one over there and one over there. So birds use their lungs to power the flow of air over vibrating membranes. Same thing as in mammals. But these membranes are not in the larynx for birds, but rather at the joint between the lungs, the bronchia, right, which would be down here, lungs, bronchia, bronchial tubes, and the trachea or windpipe. And then that thing there, that joint, is called the syrinx. So that seems to be where the sound is produced. And what's kind of interesting about that is they therefore have two voice boxes. And at least some birds can produce two different tones with them at the same time. Pretty cool, right? So what mechanisms do mammals use? Here's a little picture. We saw this picture on a previous screen. Mammals have the complex structure seen at the right. You will watch a few videos about this during the week, and you will hopefully come to understand it pretty well. The basic principle is the same for amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals, including humans. Air is forced through the larynx from below. That's the blue arrow going up. From the lungs, chest, and when it's doing that, then the vocal folds, or vocal cords, same thing, are brought close together. The vocal folds or vocal cords vibrate as the air is allowed to escape past them. The frequency at which they vibrate is determined by the amount of tension on them, plus other things like how thick they are and how much pressure is being put on them by the air. And not shown here are the resonators above the larynx, like in the mouth and throat that enhance or attenuate various upper frequencies, which create the different timbres, such as the different vowels. What about frogs and dolphins? I did say in the last page that the frogs have a larynx, which they do. But frogs and then, and, and dolphins have this too, dolphins, whales, cetaceans. What's different about them is they don't have to breathe at the same time that they vocalize. So for humans, you pretty much can't vocalize without breathing. I'm going to try it. I mean, I can make clicking sounds. I can make some of the consonant sounds, but I really can't make any vowel sounds. I can't produce tone in my larynx. Frogs can do this and some cetaceans. Here's the frog lung, the larynx, the mouth, and then there's this vocal sac underneath. So the air goes from the lung into the vocal sac. Then the vocal sac has its own musculature and it pushes air back across the larynx. It doesn't have to go in and out the mouth. It can go across the larynx because of the vocal sac. So frogs fill the pouch below the mouth that can then send pressure over the vocal folds. Dolphins, kind of similar. They have two air sacs, one up there, one down there, and it looks like they can pass it between them. I'm not sure in which direction, but then these two things are phonic lips, and as the air passes across the lips, it creates the vibration. So why does this make sense with frogs and dolphins? They're both aquatic, but they breathe air. So frogs seem to do a lot. I mean, different frogs do this in different ways, but frogs seem to vocalize above the water, but for whatever reason, they are not depending as much on respiration when they vocalize. And then dolphins, it makes sense that if they're going to vocalize under the water, they want to maybe save air for another purpose. So sort of like with a bagpipe, they fill up a bag of air and then pass it over the phonic lips, the reed of the bagpipe in a way that's separate from their breathing. And then for the dolphins, there's this thing called the melon, which is some fatty tissue which produces resonance. Okay, so mostly the last question, which of these communication sounds count as singing, song, or music? How are we going to define music? How are we define song? We might ask, does, does music or song need to be pleasurable? If you look up a dictionary definition of music, you'll probably find that it's pleasurable organized sound or something like that. It's important to ask who it's pleasurable to, to humans or to the animals that create it and listen to it. So let's take the midshipman sound that's going to go mm. Midshipmen have three sounds they make. There's that, and then the <clears throat> and then mm. <laughs> the groan, the grunt, the hump. So the groans and the grunts are considered by other midshipmen to be offensive, right? They're aggressive sounds, whereas the hum mm, is attractive. Humans wouldn't be able to guess that. Probably. And it's an important question to ask, like when I wrote a whole paper on this, trying to figure out when a female hears the male humming 
in the midshipman. She's attracted to it or not, depending on what sort of hormonal state she's in. And that's based on whether she has eggs to lay or not. And you can kind of demonstrate that she can hear the sound at times, like she can actually perceive it at times when she doesn't have eggs ready to lay. But when she does have eggs ready to lay, as soon as she hears it, she just swims toward it directly. So she seems to be very motivated to hear it out. So presumably there's some sort of pleasure or motivation that she wants to hear that sound and wants to seek it out when she's in the right hormonal state. But then the other times she seems to still hear it, but doesn't care about it. So pleasure is certainly, it's an important thing to think about, but we could ask, does it count as music? Hmm. If you say to humans, most humans would say that doesn't count as music. But if we define music as being a sound that's pleasurable to us, then we might have to say that maybe that sound is somehow pleasurable to that fish in certain moments. Okay. But then also we may ask, is pleasure the right emotion to consider? Or maybe manipulation is better. So much vocalization in animals is used for courtship. It's sometimes used for other things, defense of territory, solidification of the group, maybe, at least in humans, teaching in humans. But courtship clearly involves pleasure in some sense, but that's like the short run. In the long run, courtship is in a sense, it's like persuasion, it's motivation, but it's also manipulation. It's trying to, it's not trying to trick someone necessarily, but it is definitely trying to influence their response tendencies through some sort of sound. So that is manipulation. Manipulation doesn't have to be something that's bad for the person that you're manipulating. Sometimes you want to manipulate a child to go to sleep, and that's actually good for the child. And you use music in that way. If you said, is a lullaby pleasurable? Eh, you might, you know, sometimes maybe to some people, if you say is a lullaby manipulative of a child that you're trying to get to sleep, and the answer is like, eh, yeah, it seems like it is. So that might actually be a better question to ask or just a, a different nuance on that same question of what is music and sound in humans, music and song in humans. Should we just think about it differently instead of as pleasure as something that's a little bit more really more complex than that involves a lot of different social resonances. So we don't really need to address this question definitively yet, but we'll keep coming back to it. And uh, our answers may themselves evolve over the course of the class. So little summary, how vocalization happens. Most vertebrate animals use the same system that humans use. The lungs fill with air, the chest cavity contracts to pressure air up the windpipe and out the mouth and nose. The air passage through the larynx narrows, bringing the vocal folds or vocal cords closer together. The folds, cords vibrate passively with the outgoing airflow based on how tightly they're stretched and the amount of air pressure that's pushing up against them and also structural features like how thick they are. The frequency of the fundamental tone of vibration in the larynx is determined by the focal cords themselves. The timbre of the sound right, which produces the vowel and the resonance, is shaped by the resonance and filtering caused by the shape of the throat and mouth. So this is how it happens in humans. It's how it happens in other mammals. It's how it happens in birds, reptiles, amphibians. There are slight differences. The birds have the syrinx instead of the larynx, but otherwise it's fairly similar. Amphibians have that vocal sac that they can fill up so they don't have to use the lungs. And that's the same with some of the cetaceans, the dolphins and whales. And then fish are the most different because they don't have lungs, so they don't push air up through any kind of a larynx with pressure from the lungs. But they do produce sounds in different ways, and the brainstem regions that they use to produce those sounds are the same that all vertebrates use. Insects probably do things completely differently, but it's interesting how similar they are in many ways. So that's gonna be part of the excitement, is stuff that is different, but also the same. And then finally, how does sound happen? The term sound has both physical objective and psychological or subjective definitions defined physically or objectively. It's pressure fluctuations in some sort of medium in air, water, or solid. Defined subjectively, it's perceived pressure fluctuations in a medium. And then you can compare here ultrasound and infrasound. So ultrasound is what 
dolphins and bats use for echolocation. It's sound above 20 kilohertz. Why is it called ultra? It's just called ultra because we can't hear it, <laughs> but they can hear it just fine. So there are sounds that we can't hear, but they're still sound if you define them from the perspective of the animal. And then infrasound is the same thing. We can't hear anything below 20 hertz. We don't hear it as pitch, but other animals can hear that stuff. Like, so elephants apparently communicate in ultrasound and they can hear it. What sorts of actions produce sounds? All actions produce sounds. Even tiptoeing produces some sound, even if it's not super audible. Any kind of motion or movement produces a sound. Examples are turbulence, impact, percussion, friction, fracture, rapid deformation, excitation of resonance, implosion, explosion, and stridulation. And just to say one more thing about this, a lot of these, I think almost all of these things our musical instruments do and multiple instruments do multiple of these things so most of these things you find somewhere in the voice for instance and that's just one instrument lots of our instruments do a couple of these different things and they interact in various ways excitation of resonance interacts with turbulence in like the wind instruments okay why and how did animals become sensitive to sounds we kind of know that around the time of the early vertebrates around fish prior to amphibians before the amphibians went up onto land somewhere around that time it seems that hearing first evolved and a couple of things later happened to make hearing better on land but the ability to hear and the ability to communicate therefore with sound evolves around the time of fishes which is about 450 million years ago the devonian period and then what kind of information does sound afford well it's fast it's emphatic like i said it can really catch your attention because it's can seem like a big deal it can be loud you can hear it in 360 it's temporally nuanced and that's important because that means you can pattern it complexly so it's very good for complex communication when in time did communication sounds enter the picture because we know roughly when animals became sensitive to sound but it probably at around the same time that hearing did the general proposal is that if animals can hear they will tend ultimately to make use of the ability to hear to communicate with others and hence to manipulate them and then how do you do that do you do it with music let's say you want to manipulate someone else with sound do you do it with speech or do you do it with music well it depends on how you want to manipulate them so that's something we'll keep talking about most animals can hear and just about all animals that hear use sound to communicate in one way or another okay have a great week especially i hope you appreciate the beatboxing assignment and yeah i'm really excited about it okay enjoy